Summer is a wonderful time to worship God in the outdoors. As mentioned in Romans today, some of God's work and messages are difficult to see when others are very easy to see. It is easy to do right now. All you have to do is find a big tree, get a picnic blanket or a chair and sit underneath the tree and look up into the sky. You can almost imagine it. You're lying on your blanket or sitting on your chair looking up into the huge and wonderful tree and you can marvel at how it came to be. You can look at the branches and watch the squirrels as they play and chase each other around. You can look at the beautiful colors of the details that God made into the birds and the tree and listen to the wonderful sounds they make. Feel the breeze on your face as you feel God's love surround you. One of the things that we believe as Christians is that created things can point to God. Many of you, but maybe not all of you, know that other than the work that I do here on Sunday mornings with the children, I'm also a funeral celebrant. A funeral celebrant is um, someone who takes the place of clergy at a funeral and does the job of what a minister would normally do. However, it's normally in a non-religious or a non-denominational setting and um, I'm really celebrating the person's life. Many people seek me out because they don't have a church connection or they haven't been to church in many, many years or some of them um, seek me out because they want it absolutely non-religious. They don't want any religion in the service at all. Um, some of them are non-religious, some of them are, and they're very personalized services. So um, all of the music is picked by the family and all the, the readings are picked by the family. And they tell me about their loved one's life and I write a long eulogy and, and tell about the person who's passed away. And the music has ranged from all sorts of music, from rock music to, to Bob Marley, um, to Charlotte Church and Josh Groban and more traditional music. And um, I've had the opportunity to meet and work with many, many different families from all walks of life over the last six years in this work. And the funny thing is, is that they, they contact me because they want a non-religious funeral. And then when I get to the home, when I sit down and I start talking to them and talking about the service, they quite often say, well, you're going to do the Lord's Prayer, right? And um, well, how about that, um, the Lord is my shepherd, that reading, that thing. You know, I would like that. So even though that they have asked for a non-religious service, they ask for Amazing Grace, that's the music, or the old rugged cross. And I really find that amusing. I'm grateful for this opportunity to serve so many families in Niagara. Um, I have served almost 350 families in the last six years. And every time I go to meet with a family, I always ask every family what the person's religious background is. So it gives me an idea of what, what to work with. And it usually ends up leading into a short discussion about religion. And I don't know if they feel like I'm interrogating them or I, I, you know, I'm judging them in any way, but I just, I'm just saying, you know, did you ever go to church? What kind of church did you go to? It's almost as if they're trying to justify to me why they haven't been going to church or why they've lost their connection. And many of the families have indicated to me that they still believe in God and, um, and that they still, you know, pray. And, um, and things like that, but they just don't attend church for many different reasons. Um, some of them, they just don't have the time in their lives. Um, others have indicated to me that they've had a really bad experience at church, so it could have been in their own, or in their own congregation, or it could be, I quite often get that, well, you know, one time we got a minister to do a funeral for us 30 years ago, and he called my mom a different name, the whole church, the whole funeral. So they're you know, really upset by that and they haven't come back to church because of it. Sometimes they feel that it's overbearing um, to go to church and they haven't returned since they've got married 40 years ago. Others say that it's too political. And others yet feel that they don't need to be at church every Sunday to be able to worship God or to have a spiritual life. And, and that is where 
it kind of crosses the line into what I'm going to talk about next. It seems as though they still are seeking to have a Christian faith and a belief in God. And there is something that still draws them near to God, especially when they're facing such profound loss and sadness. Perhaps it makes them think about their own mortality. Perhaps it makes them start to evaluate the choices they've been making in their life and the way they've been living. Even though church attendance has been declining, the population still has a spiritual connection. I don't think that there is a church around right now that's not worried about the future of their church or isn't working to try to increase their congregations. And of course, we're no exception. There needs to be a shift in thinking because there is no longer a connection between having a spiritual faith and attending church every Sunday. It is kind of sad. It's almost as if people of my generation have forgotten what it was like to have nothing open on a Sunday have no sports events to go to, or running your children around from one thing to the next, birthday parties on Sunday mornings. Um, it seems as though church has been pushed aside for all of those other activities. And it makes me sad to think that my children and their children um, will just continue the frenetic pace of the whole week on Sunday, and they'll never really understand or remember or know what it was like to have a peaceful, calm family day where you just spend the whole day with your family and enjoy spending that time together as I did as a child. Of course, no one has all the answers yet, but there is, has been an amazing shift in our congregation in the last year. There are so many positive changes happening here. It's palpable, the energy, you can almost feel it. It's hard not to notice it. I also feel really blessed to be a part of this team, and especially since um, Candace has come aboard, we've been holding weekly staff meetings um, for the last several months with Eleanor and um, Rosemary and Sherry and Candace and Reverend Miller and myself. And we've been sharing our faith and we've been sharing our ideas for growth. At one of our last meetings, um, Paul started to bring this up last week, but at one of our last meetings, we were talking about bearing fruit as Christians. We also discussed how things need to be pruned in order to grow. For example, a grapevine or a fruit tree, you always, you know, when you're driving down to Niagara the Lake in the summer, you can always see the farmers out there pruning them through the winter and cutting back. And that is one thing that we can look to to make ourselves better Christians. From the beginning of time, farmers have always known that to grow something, you need not only water and sunshine, but to make it grow bigger and better and healthier, you have to prune the plant or tree, just as we need to stop and take inventory of ourselves from time to time. We need to think about the things that we can change in our lives, how we can change our attitudes, how we can be more positive, how we can make um, ourselves happier. It's not, it's not difficult, it's small little changes, and they can really add up. Um, from John 12, verse 24, it states that the secret of a disciple's life is devotion to Christ. And the characteristic of that life is its seeming insignificance and its meekness. Yet it is like a grain of wheat that falls into the ground and dies. It will spring up and change the entire landscape. This also reminded me of an independent film that I saw earlier in the spring, and it's called I Am. And it was directed and produced by a gentleman called Tom Shadiak. And he produced such movies as, um, they're all comedies. A lot of the, the movies that he made were with Jim Carrey or Robin Williams, um, such as um, Bruce Almighty. And I'm just going to show you a short um, clip or trailer for this movie so that you can kind of get a feel for what the movie is talking about. My name is Tom Shadiak. I'm a movie director. Action!
Facing my own death brought an instant sense of clarity and purpose. I decided to grab a camera and a film crew of four and start a journey to spark a conversation around challenging and rarely asked questions. Have you ever seen any of my movies? Did you ever see Ace Ventura? Ace Ventura? Did you ever hear that movie? It's a Jim Carrey movie. No. See, I need a dose of reality. We are asking some of today's significant minds what's wrong with our world and what can we do about it? Most importantly, what we could do about it. Science has discovered elements that undermine everything we've been told about how we work and how the world works. We are more interconnected with each other at a fundamental level than people realize or previously thought. The truth of who we are is that we are because we belong. The basis of nature is cooperation and democracy. It's in our DNA. We're just at the point where a technology and this narrative are beginning to come together. The science shows us that we are all connected. Very deep connections at a very deep level. This is the most profound discovery in all of physics. What we do at the individual level really does affect the global environment. We're really geared at a primordial level to feel what another person feels. It's like we are born to be our brother's keeper. It's the way that we're wired. This is the emerging story. We are far grander than we've been told. We started by asking what's wrong with the world, and we ended up discovering what's right with it. So the main question of the movie is what is wrong with the world and what can we do about it? And who's responsible for making the changes? And the answer is I am, so all of us are. The film focuses on three or four main issues. Among the issues, it also discusses how Science is finally catching up to religion, in that, that science can't explain everything. Things that religion has known as re reality for hundreds of years, science is now being able to prove. An example of this is that everyone has what is called mirror neurons in your brain. God actually built something into our brains so that we can feel other people's thoughts and pain and happiness, they mirror other people's. I'm sure that most of you have, or some of you have seen the show called America's Funniest Home Videos. Uh, we watch it on Sunday evenings. And some of, the, some of the videos are really funny, of course, but some of the accidents that happen um, cause a lot of ooh and ah, ooh. You know, when, when someone gets hit or when someone gets um, accidentally falls and something falls on top of them, you know, it's funny for a second, but then you think, ooh, you, you almost cringe, like you can feel that happening to you. That is the mirror neurons working in you. And it's a show that everybody sends in their home videos and then they're judged to see which one's the best. So when we watch someone else get hurt, we can feel their pain. And I have a couple of pictures here should come up in a moment. Everybody knows what that feels like. You can feel the happiness. The next photo. You can hold that slide for a moment. So in those those pictures, you could actually feel, you know, when, when people are in, in, in the movie as well, in that trailer that we watched where all the people were running and then they all started hugging each other, or um, the soldier coming home from a long um, stay in Afghanistan, coming back to his families. You see that on TV when they meet, or um, a soldier will come into a classroom and surprise his child by coming back earlier. And you can just see the child just start crying and run to their dad and swing him around in the air. And you can feel that joy. You feel that inside of you. 
The second thing that the film focuses on is that people have been spending too much time and effort worried about themselves and keeping up with the Joneses. We were meant to think as a community. We were meant to help each other. And some of the recent events in history have reminded us that we can really work together, such as when the miners were trapped. We can help each other out. Um, maybe these things all happened for a reason, for a lesson for all of us. Of course, 9-11 affected everyone on the planet. The tsunamis in Thailand and Japan, the flooding in New Orleans, we saw everybody come together and work as a community. And they've all showed that all of humankind is connected and can help each other when an effort is made. When you look to nature, as the documentary points out, God has created nature as a great example for us to watch as an example to all. Schools of fish all move together. Flocks of birds move together. When they're sitting on the line and then they take off, and I'm sure you've seen driving down all the starlings, like hundreds of starlings, they move, they almost look like one big bird, they all move together. There's also actually monkeys in the jungle that when they're working, when they're moving together, and there's an older monkey or a baby monkey that can't make it from one branch to another. One of the male monkeys in the group actually works as a bridge. It actually reaches over to the next and then it just stays there as a bridge and then the other monkeys all run across his back to get to the other side. Also, I found it really fascinating with a herd of deer. So I'm sure you've seen animals like this. They're grazing. The half of them are looking down. A couple are looking up to make sure there's no predators around. But one thing that I found fascinating from this movie is when they're feeding, they, they have only a certain amount of time, especially in places like Africa, when they need to leave their grazing grounds and go to find water. The journey is incredibly long. So if they leave too early, they won't have enough food in them to survive the walk. If they wait too long, they'll die because they don't have enough water. And they all decide as a herd when to leave. And the way they do it is that once the 51st percentile of the deer, so if there's 100 deer in the herd, once the 51st deer decides that it's time to go, that that's the exact moment that they need to leave, that's when they go. There's not a leader saying, okay, it's time to go for our water. They just know collectively as a group. And if there's more than one watering hole around in different directions, whichever direction the 51st percentile of them are facing, so if they're all facing north, half or over half are facing north with their heads up, that's the direction they go in. So they all work together and they work collectively as a group. What would happen if we all worked together all the time so well and worked and helped each other out all the time? The world would be a different place. They also discuss how nature only takes what it needs. Trees only take enough water for what they need and what nutrients from the soil they need. And there's life in everything. Therefore, it is easy to connect nature to God. The natives only hunted as much as they needed. They didn't fill a huge freezer full of meat that just went and spoiled. And they also didn't hunt just for themselves or for their family. They hunted for the whole community so that they cared for their sick, they cared for their elderly, and they cared for their young. The hunter never just went out enough just to get enough food without sharing it with all of their neighbors. They also explore in this movie how one person can really make a difference, but really not on their own. Certainly Martin Luther King didn't single-handedly complete and change the quality for black Americans on his own, but he put seeds into several different people who then spread that same energy and that same idea to others, which in turn, of course, spread it to more and more. Women's rights share the same movement. We do do a lot of great work in our church. We have an exciting future. We have a wonderful group of young people which has been growing and they are our future. They are an integral part of this church and we need to continue to encourage them and support them. 
In the scripture that was read today from Philippians chapter 2, we are reminded that Jesus knowingly and actively embraced a life of giving, serving, losing, and dying, and we are all called to do the same. We all have love in our hearts to give, and we can always help out in even small ways, even if it's just donating things that you have in your home, or volunteering, or praying for others. Tom Shediak in the movie was a multimillionaire. He had several multi-million dollar mansions all over the world. And once he was faced with death after a serious bike accident, he actually just sold everything. He sold all his multi-million dollar homes and the artwork and all of the things that he thought were making him happy and chose to live in a mobile community. And he now rides his bike to the university where he teaches. God views service and humility as strengths, not weaknesses. What can we do to show our greater humility? What can we do to expand our service to others? One of the last points of the movie was that some people don't go to church on a regular basis, or some people that do go to church on a regular basis, sorry. They walk through the doors, just as we all did today, and we all feel kind of immediate sense of home. We, these, all of you are our family. All of you are our friends. And we feel calmness. We love to sing. We love to praise God. We love the prayer and the sense of community. We love praying for others and for ourselves and the good feeling it gives us when we leave here. We walk out the door feeling on top of the world. However, what percentage of these people that go to church every Sunday actually spread that joy in the Word of God to others? Today I want to leave you with these questions for this week to think about. How many of us share the feeling with our friends and our co-workers of how much we enjoy coming to church? How many of us live our lives the other six days of the week the way that we do on Sunday mornings, truly honoring our commitment of living as Christians, being kind to other people, but to being part of this church and honoring our commitments to God? Thanks be to God.